The second season of American Crime Story grapples with the pitfalls of gay experiences in the 90s, to mixed but fascinating results. A consuming sadness presides over the new installment of FX's American Crime Story anthology series, The Assassination of Gianni Versace, where its predecessor, The People v. O.J. Simpson, easily traded in searing socio-political timeliness, The Assassination of Gianni Versace has less obvious topicality. It's the grim story of Andrew Cunanan, the spree killer whose final act before committing suicide was to gun down famed fashion designer Gianni Versace outside his palatial Miami Beach home in 1997. Wealth and status and the particularly American hunger for them are themes evoked by this shocking murder tale, a random nobody snuffing out the life of a rich and powerful man in an effort to best him and become him. But beyond that, the story would seem to have less scope than the trial of O.J. Simpson did, less relevance for American life, not enough urgent bite to sustain a nine-episode television series. And so producer Ryan Murphy and the writer Tom Rob Smith, of the similarly probing and despondent London Spy, are forced to get both more granular and more expansive, placing Cunanan's crimes and Versace's legacy in a more abstract cultural context. They've tried, ardently, to figure out what this murder, and Cunanan's other murders, might mean in some bigger sense, if they mean anything at all. What they've come up with is erratic, arresting, often deeply unsettling. And, yes, bitterly sad. The assassination of Gianni Versace is not the detailing of a murder spree as much as it is a taxonomy of gay tragedy. It illustrates the maiming effect of the closet and the ways a society's codified reverence for money and clout can badly entangle with private yearnings forced into the margins, into the dark. I'm not quite sure I buy all of its despairing theses, but the assassination of Gianni Versace still grips like a vice, and a vice, as it descends into hell. It is hell, really. Spending eight hours I've not seen the last episode with Andrew Cunanan is exhausting, miserable. A sweaty suave con man and likely sociopath guided by quixotic visions of luxury, Cunanan is a user and an annihilator, circling the abyss in a decaying orbit. He's Tom Ripley without any of the floppy charm. That charm is supposed to be there, I think, but the way he's written and the way he's played by Darren Crisp taking a major role and really going for it make it near impossible to feel. Which isn't a criticism, exactly. The show does at least convince you why some of its characters are taken by this swanning, ridiculous climber, even if we in the audience know what horrors he's capable of. We know because we might already be familiar with the story, Vanity Fair contributor Maureen North's book Vulgar Favors is the primary source here, but also because the assassination of Gianni Versace mostly works in reverse chronology. It opens with Versace's murder, then inches back into Cunanan's life as we meet his previous victims before presenting something of a sympathetic origin story, in a ballsy move that surprisingly pays off. This harrowing dissection of a killer's trajectory is offset by a less compelling peek into the world of Versace, Edgar Ramirez, his sister Donatella, a terrific Penelope Cruz, and his lover Antonio Ricky Martin, a nice surprise. While Smith's script tries to draw parallels between Cunanan's thwarted conniving for the gay American, or Italian, dream and Versace's achievement of it, it doesn't quite land. I love watching Cruz glide around a mansion smoking cigarettes and looking pained, but it all feels like it's borrowed from a different, more fabulous, less searching series. The true meat of the show is its attempt at diagramming the pitfalls of the gay experience in the 1990s, looking at AIDS and Don't Ask, Don't Tell, in particular, and more diffusely surveying a community bonded by loneliness and secrecy and no small amount of buried shame. This is at once a grindingly pessimistic outlook on gay existence and a horrifyingly relatable one. Especially striking and awful is an episode centered on David Madsen, the young Minneapolis architect who was the second person killed during the spree. The episode is flat-out devastating, with the excellent newcomer Cody Fern playing Madsen as a quiet and kind man whose friendliness is cruelly exploited and punished by Q Nannan. It's not really a political episode, a shame, not like the subsequent one about first victim Jeff Trail, Finn Wittrock, also great, whose career in the Navy was compromised because he was gay. But the Madsen episode still cuts right to the heart of the show's sorrowful idea, its rendering of Cunanan as a malevolent force created of a collective gay longing and oppression. Was he, though? What, exactly, was Cunanan a byproduct of?
The penultimate episode of the season puts forth some possible answers to that question, in the form of Andrew's father, Modesto, a commanding, creepy John John Bryan is, a Coen Brothers-esque doomed huckster who dotes on his son well beyond what is healthy. Maybe it was just because I'd been sitting with this story for seven hours at that point, but this episode kinda sold me on its theory of how and why Cunanan eventually broke, instead as he was in an unyielding dream bored into him, quite terribly, by his father. In Sho's estimation, Cunanan's rapacious pursuit of social intrae was perversely linked to his craving for love, the companionship, for the validation and confirmation he thought a romantic partner could provide. And yet, in the show, Cunanan is almost comically incapable of finding and securing that, he's too carried away, too delusional, too selfish. No one wants your love, a character angrily spits at Cunanan in one episode. It's a shattering line, expressing Cunanan's worst fear, and maybe, so many of our own. Such malfunction, such hideousness is implied in that blunt course, to be not just unlovable, but to be past that, where the loved one merely offers up his vile and unneeded, laughable and easily dismissed. The assassination of Gianni Versace swaps people v. OJ's not illegal systems for these dense psychological ones, turning Cunanan into a manifestation of a common annoying worry, that we are silly and without worth, that we are abhorrent in our desire. It's something queer people have been hearing for centuries, and for our whole individual lives. Of course, in making a show about him, FX is essentially giving this murderer the glory he so wanted, which gives the assassination of Gianni Versace a tinge of the problematic. Adjacent to that, I'm sure there will be plenty of people who find something too outsized and effortful about Chris's performance. But to believe the series, and Orth's book, Cunanan was just this kind of over-articulated showman, a desperate, and drug-addled wannabe sophisticate who used his innate smarts to spin or tenuous, dangerous fantasy. I think Chris renders that cataclysmic energy pretty well, even if he is maybe too pretty for the role. The assassination of Gianni Versace has a narcotic pull. Its shifting sense of scale is dizzying as Chris insouciantly flings from extreme to extreme, from prevarication to peril. Smith has written a fraught, deeply personal piece that, in doing its noble best to be compassionate, somehow makes victims and villains and horrors of us all. I can't imagine what straight people will think of it, if they even watch it. And I'm nervously anticipating the varied reaction from gay viewers. To me, the show is both balm and menace, lure of exploitation and primal scream. The series doesn't have the seismic prestige heft of People v. OJ, and it doesn't share its forebears' piercing intelligence. But in its messy and obliterating swirl, the assassination of Gianni Versace does something ambitious and rattling. It frames a gay disaster as an intrinsically American one, binding personal values with national ones, tethering one sense of self-worth to another. In this particular assessment, Andrew Cunanan was not all of us. But he was certainly of us, a son who spun away, a brother who disappeared in all his mad scramble to be seen, taking with him five other lives, now enshrined in tragedy and forever unfulfilled.